Hello, and welcome to NCSL's webinar on the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. I'm Ann Morse, and I'm the Program Director for the National Conference of State Legislatures Immigrant Policy Project and at NCSL's Task Force on Immigration and the States. Refugee resettlement seems to be in the news every day. The United Nations has said that the world is facing the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Countries around the world are grappling with how to respond. The United States, which currently accepts 70,000 refugees per year, has offered to take 85,000 this fiscal year and 100,000 next year. Today, we have with us two experts to provide the framework for the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program, first created in 1980, and current trends and, and issues. Representatives for the United States Department of State and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services will walk us through the process of how refugees are approved, vetted, and resettled in the United States. In particular, we will hear more about the state role in refugee resettlement. One state, in fact, pioneered the Federal Refugee Resettlement Plan. In 1975, responding to a personal request from President Gerald Ford, Iowa Governor Robert Ray agreed to accept victims of the war in Southeast Asia and created a Governor's Task Force for Indo-Chinese Resettlement to manage refugees in that state. Today, the program involves an extensive network of federal, state, and nonprofit partners, and we look forward to hearing the presenters and the opportunity to hear your questions. Before we turn to our presenters, I'd like to point out that resources available for download at any time during this webinar are on your screen. Click on the media library icon in the upper right-hand corner. It looks like a yellow piece of paper with a blue graph, bar graph in front of it. You can also find NCSL's primer on refugee resettlement there. After the presenters finish, we will hold a question and answer session. For those joining us via the web, please feel free to use the chat box on the lower left part of your screen to submit any questions ahead of time. Now to turn to today's guest. We had expected to see Larry Bartlett today, but he was unfortunately called away. We are pleased to welcome Kelly Gallagher instead. Thank you, Kelly. Kelly is the Deputy Director of Refugee Resettlement Admissions Office of the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. She contributes to policy development on both overseas and domestic refugee admissions issues. She joined PRM's admissions office as a presidential management intern in 1999, thereafter serving as re reception and placement officer and coordinator for overseas cultural o orientation, and has been a program officer for admissions from Africa. She has also conducted oversight of PRM's eight resettlement support centers and managed the worldwide refugee admissions pipeline. Bob Carey. Hi, Bob. is the director of Ref Office of Refugee Resettlement in HHS, which he joined just about a year ago. He previously serves as the Vice President of, Refugee, of Res me, Resettlement and Migration Policy at the International Rescue Committee, leading on refugee, immigration, anti-trafficking, and community development policy. Bob also served for 10 years at the IRC as Vice President of Resettlement, where he oversaw IRC's assistance to refugees, helping thousands establish new lives in the U.S. and become self-sufficient, productive citizens. Bob has served as the Chair of Refugee Council USA, which is a coalition of NGOs that work on issues affecting refugees, asylum seekers, displaced persons, victims of trafficking, and victims of torture. Now, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Kelly. Take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Anne, for introducing us. Thanks for having us here uh, talk about this topic that I agree with Anne. Seems like it's on the front pages of all the papers these days. Um, Anne mentioned that the U.S. Resettlement Program has uh, received about 70,000 refugees each of the last three years, and this year we're going for 85,000 refugees. Uh, every year the President, after consultations with Congress, sets a refugee ceiling um, that guides the, the program going forward, and the President has established a ceiling of 85,000 refugees this year. Um, I just want to say a couple things up front. Anne has asked me to speak about three things. I'm going to use about 10 or 15 minutes to do that and then turn to Bob and then questions. Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the overseas resettlement process first, and then current trends and numbers about what you're probably all seeing in the States, and then a little bit about the role of the state. So um, you all probably know the United States has the largest refugee resettlement program in the world. Uh, we resettle more refugees than all other countries combined. These days, uh, the United Nations counts about 30 resettlement countries that operate programs like we do. And just up front, I want to make sure that we're distinguishing between our refugee resettlement program and our asylum program. So I'm not talking about the numbers of like, the situation that you're seeing in Europe with asylum seekers flowing across their borders. Obviously, countries in Europe are seeing a lot 
larger numbers of asylum seekers than we are. But we're talking today just about the orderly offshore resettlement program that we and about 30 other countries operate, where we identify candidates overseas, we interview them overseas, do medical and security checks overseas, and then transport them here to the United States. We in the U.S., of course, also have an asylum program. We don't get nearly the number of asylum seekers that countries in Europe do, but of course we do have a flow across our southwest border. So let me just start by talking about the Department of State role in the overseas resettlement process. There are two primary government agencies that have a role in determining which refugees come to the United States. Uh, one is my organization, the Department of State, and then the other is the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the Department of State is the one that recommends to the president and then lays out the, what the refugee program will look like in the coming year. We, uh, we establish processing priorities, we look at uh, nationality priorities, and we establish a worldwide network of uh, staff who are working to prepare cases for interview. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has a very crucial role uh, in the middle of the process overseas, where we work to, to determine who gets to make a refugee claim to a Department of Homeland Security officer, and then DHS sends officers uh, to locations all over the world and sits down with refugees for 90 minutes or two hours and tries to determine if that uh, individual or family are admissible to the United States under U.S. law and then help launch all the security checks. So although today I'm going to be talking a lot about the role of the United Nations, High Commissioner for Refugees, the role of NGOs, the role of resettlement support centers, it's very important to keep in mind that it's the United States government agencies that are making the ultimate decisions about who will be admitted to the United States. So I said something earlier about the role of UNHCR, this is also known as the UN Refugee Agency. They are the UN agency that has the responsibility uh, overseas and the mandate for uh, the protection of refugees. And one of their primary roles in that regard is determining which refugees are in need of resettlement. Uh, in recent years, UNHCR has said that in any given year, there are about one million refugees in need of resettlement, meaning that they probably won't find their other two possible dur durable solutions, either integrating in the country they're in or returning home anytime soon. And so they believe that and for a variety of reasons that they're vulnerable, they are in need of resettlement. So although the United Nations believes that about a million refugees are in need of resettlement, it's not likely that any more than about 100,000 or 150,000 of those will actually find homes in any given year. So only a very small percentage of, of people who are determined to be in need of resettlement are actually resettled every year. So we are all, all resettlement countries are trying to focus on the most vulnerable refugees. And those could be religious minorities, victims of violence and torture, LGBT refugees, people who have medical needs that can't be served in their country of origin, uh, victims of rape, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so there are three pathways to be considered for resettlement to the United States. We call them priority one, two, and three, and I'll try to distill them down without providing too many details. Um, Essentially, a P1 referral is an individual referral. The vast majority come from United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Some can also come from our embassies, and some can come from specially trained NGOs. A priority two group is a group of special humanitarian concern, and there are two different ways that you can get into the program that way. There are UNHCR group referrals, such as the Burmese in Thailand, the Bhutanese in Nepal, Bhutanese in Nepal Congolese in Rwanda that we've been resettling in recent years. Uh, our, our more well-known P2s are probably our direct application P2s. You probably have heard about our program, our direct application program for U.S.-affiliated Iraqis, the Iraqis who are at risk because they work for the U.S. government, U.S. military, U.S.-based media or NGO organization. We also have priority two designations for Iranian, certain Iranian religious minorities, certain former Soviet Union religious minorities, and so on. Finally, we have family reunification category, also known as priority three whereby if you're a refugee or an asylee here in the United States, you can file a, a request for your children, uh, unmarried children under 21, spouse and parent, to have a refugee resettlement interview. So it's different from an immigration petition. It's not a right to be admitted, but it's a right to have a, it's an ability to have a refugee interview. So as I noted before, the role of the federal government is very important here. No matter how a case is referred to us for consideration, the case then comes to us and 
uh, we make the decision. Uh, it's not the United Nations making the decision. It's the U.S. government making the decision about who is admissible to the United States. That involves a series of interviews by, by some State Department people who are posted at resettlement support centers around the world. These are contractors. Um, and then the essential in-person 90-minute or so Department of Homeland Security interview, uh, followed by a battery of security checks. Um, we have uh, tried, especially since the events in Paris last year, uh, to uh, make the American public better educated about the security checks that refugees are subject to. You've probably seen, or you may have seen, the White House has a number of good infographics. We have a number of them as well that show how refugees are subject to more security checks than any other category of traveler to the United States. That involves the Department of Defense, the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, and a number of other agencies. Only once a refugee applicant has passed all of those security checks are they then eligible to um, get on a plane and come to the United States. Okay, let me turn to current trends and numbers. As Anne said, we are aiming for 85,000 refugee admissions this year. Uh, it's a jump from the 70,000 we've been doing for each of the last three years, and it is going to be a challenge. We are working as hard as we can to get to 85, but we have a number of challenges in growing the program by 15,000 people over the course of the year. Um, our largest populations that we're admitting this year are Iraqis, Burmese, Somalis, and Congolese. Uh, you've probably also heard a lot about Syrians. We, up until this point, have not admitted uh, very many Syrians. I think it's about 2,800 now since 2011, since the start of the conflict. Uh, you may have heard the President in September say that the U.S. goal is to admit 10,000 Syrian refugees this year, and we are working toward that goal. Um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned earlier that our, our program is very diverse. Uh, Although these nation the five nationalities I just referred to make up the bulk of refugee admissions, we expect to admit between 65 and 70 different nationalities this year. So that's another thing that makes the U.S. resettlement program different from a lot of other countries' resettlement programs. We have a truly worldwide operation uh, that tries to reach people all over the world. Um, let me turn very quickly to the role of states. Uh, as Bob will, will likely mention when we get to him, most states have a, a state refugee coordinator that works closely with the Department of Health and Human Services and also less so, but also with the State Department. Um, states have always played an important role in, in the refugee resettlement process, although it is the federal government that decides who can be admitted to the United States as a refugee. Um, and then once a refugee is admitted, he or she has the right to live anywhere he or she would like. Um, the states have an important role to play. And so in short, every spring, late spring, early summer, uh, resettlement agencies that take part in our reception and placement program submit uh, proposals to us uh, through which they propose how many refugees they would like to resettle in which communities. We have about 180 resettlement communities around the United States. Um, and between those 180 communities, about 350 or so uh, resettlement agencies. So these are the Catholic Charities of uh, Nashville or International Rescue Committee of Phoenix, Arizona. There's about 350 of those offices in about 180 communities. Those agencies, when they submit their proposals to us, uh, in terms of what they hope they will be able to resettle in the coming year, are required to conduct consultations with a wide variety of stakeholders at the state and local level. So this is not only the schools and the police and the fire department and other state agencies, health and human service agencies, it's also uh, community groups, churches, um, other interested parties. Those consultations have to happen on a quarterly basis. And one of those has to happen immediately before an agency submits their proposal to us so that we know that um, these, these numbers have been discussed. As a final last check, before we approve which numbers can be placed in which communities, we send those agencies' proposals back out to the state, um, back to the state refugee coordinator that, that works ultimately for the governor, uh, to get their comments to make sure that they had, were, had, the, had the opportunity to comment when the agency was, 
submitting the proposal, and then we're sending them back to them just to make sure, make do a double check to make sure that they had input into the process. Um, since the events of last fall, when a number of governors expressed opposition to Syrian resettlement, and the White House Chief of Staff, Dennis McDonough, conducted a phone call with uh, all the governors in the country, uh, we have established uh, based on Dennis McDonough's pledge, a, a new report that we send to governors who are interested in receiving the report. I believe 25 or 26 countries have now signed on to receive that report. And it's a report to the governor or someone in the governor's office telling them uh, how many refugees of which nationalities were resettled to their state in the previous month. I think I'm going to stop there and turn it over to my colleague, Bob, and then we'll both be available for questions. Take it over, Bob. Uh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Kelly. It's very much, it's an honor to be here. As um, Kelly referenced, you know, resettlement takes place at the local and community level. It's really about in the engagement of civil society actors across the country. Um, and so it's very much an honor to be engaging with you. And it's been, as it has been, to work in service to these populations uh, for a number of years. Um, so I would like to thank you for your commitment and dedication to public service and participating in this uh, process. And uh, point out that the work of the Office of Refugee Resettlement is to facilitate a process. It's to, in essence, give refugees tools uh, to assist them in becoming self-sufficient as quickly as possible. The U.S. program is a very much public-private partnership, as Kelly referenced. Um, there are, at the national and local level, um, multiple partners. Most major religious denominations are represented in, that, um, in, in these partnerships. And it includes uh, contributions of tens of thousands of volunteers and community actors across the country, as well as uh, considerable private contributions which leverage the federal funds and enhance them to uh, facilitate the process. Um, Service to the most vulnerable is at the heart of the mission of the U.S. Resettlement Program. We are assisting individuals who've been through dislocation, uh, torture in many cases, trauma, who've lost everything, and who are seeking a new life for themselves and for their children. So it's very much a program that reflects the core American values uh, on which our country was founded, and I think uh, is a central part of our national identity and tradition. Um, so we have undertaken a critical task, which is creating a path to survival and ultimately citizenship for people displaced by targeted persecution and devastating loss. Um, ORR's means of helping refugees to assist to integrate into communities in the United States is by linking them to resources that assist them in becoming self-sufficient as quickly as possible and contributing to the communities in which they live. I'd like to underscore that um, it is very much a, uh, a, a tenet of the program that refugees bring with them skills and values, talent, and a considerable energy that they um, have proven time and time again to uh, revitalize communities. They start businesses at, at very high rates, much higher than um, the mainstream population. So they uh, do contribute greatly to the communities to which they um, which they go. And receiving communities play a critical role in our efforts to resettle refugees. Um, we, we seek um, to engage, as do our partners, um, civil society actors and civil institutions. As Kelly mentioned, consultation is a critical part of the program. Um, we require, as does the Department of State, that our partners consult with schools, with civil society actors, and with other, uh, other law enforcement, and we also, as, as was referenced, have in most states a state refugee coordinator who is charged with ensuring that the, the coordination of services to these populations across the state. In addition to that, many states have a state refugee health coordinator who uh, coordinates the provision of medical services to refugees. All refugees who enter the U.S go through an exhaustive medical screening prior to their arrival, but there's also a requirement that they go through screenings post-arrival to ensure that any medical conditions uh, that they arrive with are treated promptly and effectively. 
and that any follow-up uh, services are, are received as appropriate. Um, our, uh, our, in addition to the state health coordinators and state refugee coordinators, ORR also has regional coordinators who ensure that these federal services are closely integrated with other services available at the, at the state level. Um, uh, we are always seeking to improve the program and to look at ways that we can better coordinate our services and do things to better effect. As Kelly has referenced, the populations are always changing as the humanitarian needs uh, shift from region to region. So as a consequence, we need to ensure that at the local and community level, we are communicating the most accurate and the most current information about the populations we serve and their needs and ensuring that the services that ORR funds are responsive to those needs, whether they're psychosocial, educational, medical, um, or, or any other. Um, and, uh, you know, we conduct broad local outreach with civil society actors as well as with stakeholders and previously resettled refugees who were often playing a part uh, in the receiving communities to ensure that uh, their countrymen or those from another country who've been through a similar experience are welcome and oriented. Orientation on an ongoing basis is a critical part of the program as well. Um, ORR, the, the mechanisms through which ORR works in terms of our funding are multiple. We have direct funding to states, which uh, reimburses costs of uh, cash and medical assistance for which refugees are categorically eligible as um, a legal resident, any other legal resident would be once they arrive in the United States. Um, for those who are not eligible, refugees are eligible for eight months of refugee cash assistance. Um, which is reimbursed, uh, distributed through the states, but also but reimbursed through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. In addition, uh, there are a host of social service programs, all in support of resettlement and in support of employment. The U.S. Refugee Program, which operates um, under authority that's delineated in the Refugee Act of 1980, focuses heavily on assisting refugees in becoming self-sufficient as quickly as possible. So that's a central component. The services, uh, the majority of the services that ORR funds are either uh, related to employment or in support of family self-sufficiency and employment. So those include English language instruction operated through both a variety of funders, depending on how the state has chosen to align those services, direct employment services through a variety of different um, programs, um, inducional programs include um, agricultural partnerships to assist refugees in, in, um, in farming and uh, microenterprise development, school impact grants to assist schools in, uh, in integrating refugee children who often are coming with um, having had limited access to formal education or interrupted education as a consequence of their flight from home and displacement. Uh, we also have a number of alternative programs. Just as an example, we have a ORR funds at the national level, a refugee matching grant employment program. Um, I think it, it embodies many of the principles of the programs across, uh, across the country in that it's uh, a program where our federal funds are matched by privately raised uh, private funds and volunteer time uh, to assist refugees in an intensive employment search process that extends for um, five or six months. Our outcome data from this and other programs are extraordinarily positive. The most recent matching grant outcome shows that of the participants in the program, over 85% are employed in full-time employment at the end of six months of participation. So um, it demonstrates that refugees um, in the main are going to work and they're going to work quickly and they are contributing greatly to um, the well-being of their of their communities. Um, I think I'll kind of wrap it up there uh, and leave it to questions because I could go on for uh, hours and that would probably uh, be more information than you would really want or need. So I think we do have, I'd like to just reference, ORR does have a website uh, that has considerable information on our program and our state coordinators or local uh, officials or our staff here 
are always available and open to respond to questions and, and provide additional information about the details of the refugee resettlement program. So I'd like to thank you for being here today. Um, and thank you for many of you I know are um, partners in this process and your valued partners. And we welcome your input and involvement at every level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly and Bob. I am going to turn the management of the Q&A over to Gilberto Mendoza on our staff. We have received several questions, and he'll give them to you. Um, if there are additional questions, please remember to type it into the chat box, and we'll relay them to the speakers. Thank you. So the first question is for Bob. Um, the question is, sounds like NGOs, governor's offices, and governor's de um, departments coordinate on info regarding refugees. Are there states where a legislature has a place or role in this loop of communication? Um, I, I just like to point out that I also have two colleagues here um, who are the, some of the senior Kenneth Toda and um, and <clears throat> uh, Kate Wolf, who, who I may turn to to answer specific questions because they are subject matter experts in a number of these issues. So perhaps Ken, who's acted, interacted a great deal with, um, with, with state legislative bodies, may be able to respond best to that question. So in, um, so in sure. Okay. I'll come <laughs> slide over here. <laughs> right. um, so as part of um, really the consultation process um, at the state level, um, the state coordinator would really be in charge of really coordinating to make sure that um, entities, either state legislators, um, those at the more local community level, community officials, are actually part of that consultation process. And so we encourage them to reach out at all the different levels uh, to really uh, be, make sure that um, individuals do have part, uh, part of the ability to really participate in that process. Um, our next question um, comes from North Carolina. If a state legislature were to instruct a state to cease cooperating with the Department of Health and Human Services refugee resettlement efforts, what would the practical consequences be for the state and for the refugees? Additionally, are there other avenues available for HHS to achieve their aims if a particular state chooses not to cooperate? Or, um, So Bob or um, Kelly, feel free to answer. Um, thank you, Kelly. Uh, well, the, the Refugee Resettlement Program is a federal program. And um, a number of states have, through the years, elected not to, uh, not, not to administer the program at the state level. So in those instances, um, the governor has um, essentially withdrawn the state from participation in the program. As a, con as a consequence of that, the, um, the, the, the responsibility for managing the program is turned over to a voluntary agency that's designated to do so at the state level. So um, the state no longer administers or manages the program, but um, so it's, it ends up continuing, but through a, um, an alternative mechanism that's managed by uh, nonprofit organizations in the state uh, who assist refugees and coordinate among themselves with a lead agency that's designated and serves as uh, an interlocutor um, with still coordinates um, with state, county, and other uh, entities, but um, is, it is done in the stead of the, of the state refugee coordinator of the governor's office by a nonprofit entity. Great. Thank you for that answer. Um, another question we received is, um, has there been efforts or programs to match skilled refugees with states or localities that have skill gaps, um, or resource to help educated skilled refugees continue their profession uh, you know, from abroad here in the US? Uh, do you want to take that, or do you want to start that at least? Sure. I'm. I'm not sure if I, I. I think it's. I got the second part. I'm not sure if I fully understood the first part. But um, many refugees come here with or they come with a great range of talents and experience, which range from you know 
farmers to former ambassadors. So we, we are serving a, a broad array of people. Um, many who come here are quite well educated um, and come with considerable skills and talents. Um, that has proven to be, as it is for any other individual who's coming to the U.S. from abroad, a challenge in terms of recertifying or credential recognition. So ORR has um, engaged in, and we are continuing to work on um, providing technical assistance to assist in some of those reaccreditation processes. Uh, it's still quite challenging, uh, particularly for individuals such as engineers or medical professionals. But um, both we and our partners, as well as the voluntary agencies, have a number of initiatives that work to assist in those processes. Um, for you know, as the state, as Kelly can reference, each um, working under the State Department reception program, each agency is charged with developing a resettlement plan for each refugee. So, as appropriate, that might would include reaccreditation or a path to reaccreditation that would be part of a long-term plan, both with short-term self-sufficiency, say working in a job while going through an accreditation process, or um, a series of, of other steps that would lead, hopefully, eventually towards reaccreditation or work in their field. The only other thing I'd add to that is that I, th I think we'd welcome having um, a, a more detailed conversation with NCSL and others at the state level about this. This reminds me of a conversation that I had in Nashville at uh, a gathering in the fall. I think it was in November of NCSL's, I think it was an immigration uh, policy group. And I was speaking to a gentleman who was a legislator from, I believe, Mississippi or, or Alabama, one of the states in the South, and he, or maybe Georgia, he was telling me about uh, the number of truck driving jobs that were unfilled in, in his state or in the region and how it would be great if we could find a way to, um, to match up refugees either who had truck driving skills or who would be interested in, in uh, training to be a truck driver uh, to come to the southern states. We don't really have many resettlement agencies in, in the states that he referenced, especially not Mississippi and Alabama. But it's something, and it's something I've just been thinking about ever since we had that conversation, but haven't really had the chance to, to delve deeper into it. So I think it would be an interesting conversation to continue. Great. Um, so this, um, G, the GAO report came out this week on the need to improve monitoring on the care of unaccompanied child migrants. Can you talk about the steps you're taking and how the federal government can work more closely with states? Certainly, we have considerable, um, we, we work to coordinate the program. I, I, while I'm here to talk about the refugee resettlement program, I can give kind of a brief answer and we'd be happy to follow up with additional information or respond to questions. Um, about the GAO report or others as appropriate or necessary. And I might uh, turn to my colleague, Kate Wolf, um, who can respond with some brief information about that program. Kate, Thanks, Bob. Um, so we are uh, in the process of working through the recommendations from the GAO report for the Unaccompanied Children's Program. We had already taken several steps to implement the recommendations prior to the report's release. Um, under Bob's leadership, we have started a new monitoring initiative um, that is enhancing our monitoring of our programs across ORR. Um, we are also uh, working very closely with our interagency partners and stakeholders around um, improving our follow-up and post-release resources and services that we provide to unaccompanied children, um, and we are also um, working to continue improvements to our program to ensure that we have enough uh, capacity within our shelter network to care for all of the kids referred to us in any given year. Um, and as Bob said, you know, we're happy to follow up with some additional questions about unaccompanied children because I'm sure that there's a lot of questions about the refugee program that we want to get to today as well. Great. Thank you. Um, Kelly, you mentioned that you use contractors um, overseas um, to, for screening purposes. Can you talk about um, their qualification criteria and what are the qualification criteria for resettlement organizations on the local level? 
Sure. On the overseas side, um, I, I want to make sure that the questioner is aware. When I say that we use contractors overseas to to help with processing and, and submit security checks, uh, they're gathering information and submitting it to uh, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of State that we then in turn uh, forward to the law enforcement law enforcement and intelligence agencies like NCTC, FBI, DOD that I, that I spoke about. So I don't want anybody to have the idea that there are contractors who are on the ground who are conducting security checks. They're simply collecting the information and, and submitting it for us to run the security checks. But if that wasn't the, the gist of the question and it's just the qualification, qualification criteria, uh, the, the criteria for selecting an organization to run one of our resettlement support centers are laid out in uh, requests for proposals that we advertise on grants.gov every year. Um, and in general, it's a, an organization that has the ability to carry out this type of work. So let's take uh, the International Organization for Migration that runs our program in Amman with sub offices in Baghdad and Cairo. It has to be an organization that has the ability to operate in those environments. Operating in a, an environment like Baghdad is is not easy, um, and we look for an organization that has not only the staff but the budget and just the skills, the uh, ability to run a, a, one of our resettlement support centers. Um, on the domestic side, similarly, we are very close to posting our request for proposals for the FY17 reception and placement program. You can find those on grants.gov as well, and there. I don't have the qualifications in front of me. The basic qualifications are you have to be an organization with a nationwide network. You can't just apply to be part of the program if you have one office in one city somewhere. You have to have a nationwide network. And you have to have at least three years of experience of uh, providing services to refugees uh, or other migrants, but I believe it's mostly focused on refugees. And you have to show that you have the financial capacity and the ability to, um, to, to garner the, the amount of volunteer hours and contributions that are necessary to help fill in the private part of the public-private partnership. Great. Another question we have is, what factors go into determining, determining how many refugees and which refugees from a, among the larger pool are resettled in a particular state? In a particular state, okay. So the overall number is guided by a number of things. So let's just start at the national level. The overall number is, is first of all, uh, our, the budget that's available is one of the driving factors. And so this year we have the budget uh, available to, to admit 85,000 refugees. And then the overall, within that 85,000 person ceiling, we have regional allocations. So I won't go through all of them, but just for example, Within that 85 ceiling, we have the authorization to bring in up to 25,000 refugees from Africa, up to 34,000 from the Near East and South Asia, and I believe up to 3,000 from Latin America. So that are within that overall ceiling, there are regional allocations. In terms of what determines which nationalities go where, um, when the resettlement agents submit proposals to us every summer for the coming fiscal year, and let's just take it as an example. Let's take an organization that has 20 affiliates throughout the country. Uh, they will give us a proposal that details their capacity at each of those 20 affiliates. So they may say in um, Boise, we have caseworkers who speak these languages. We have here is the average housing price, the average you know, uh, time that it takes to get a job. Um, we have a, a special relationship with the Center for Victims of Torture. They, they detail the capacity that they have at that location and for each of their locations. And they send that all in to us. And then when our panel uh, reviews the proposals, we make a determination about whether, and in concert again with consulting with the state, um, we make a determination about whether we think that agency has the ability to handle that number of refugees from those regions. So it's not. When this agency, when they submit the proposal to us, they won't say, we want to resettle 10 Syrians, 20 Somalis, 100 Burmese. They don't get into that level of specificity, but they'll give us the regions from which they break it down by the same regions we do, Africa, Latin America, Europe, um, Middle East, South Asia. 
they'll say, we believe we have the capacity for 200 from this region, 100 from that region, and here's why. And so when we review the proposal and we say yes or no or we tweak it a bit, after the agency has that general framework approved in terms of the, the number up to which they can, they can place in that location and a general framework about the region, it's up to them to determine on a weekly basis which cases they're actually going to place in that community. So if an organization said, we believe that we have the capacity to resettle 100 refugees from the Near East and South Asia next year, and we say, OK, um, they then will determine on a weekly basis as the approved refugee cases are coming in that they're, they're selecting for resettlement, they can choose how many of those are Syrians, how many are Iraqis, how many are Congolese, uh, Somalis, et cetera. So we approve the overall framework, but then the resettlement agencies make the individual case decisions, often based on things like family ties that are in that location. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, um, how often do you guys go out and visit a state in which uh, which is resettling refugees to learn on the scene what is going on. Do you want to start and I'll finish, or do you want? Certainly. Um, you know, it, as as Kate referenced, we have a ORR has also has in the last year launched an enhanced monitoring program across all of our programs that we will be going out with greater frequency. But uh, and the goal there is to have every program visited, and that by every program. Um, you know, each state will has countless programs. Uh, you know, school impact, um, state program, whatever. To have each of those visited at least three years. So as a consequence, there are well, and, and as a as a reality, in any given year, there are multiple visits by ORR monitors to visit a host of different programs um, in, in each state. But and that will includes meeting at the state coordinator at the state level as well as meeting with individual grantees at the community and county level. So um, you know, it, it's a complex response, but I think the goal um, which we will be implementing this year is a minimum of every three years for each grant program that we have in each state. Um, so. And from the Department of State side, um, like OR, we go out for two different, we don't have regional offices, we do all of our our, our visits from Washington, but we do uh, community visits for two different reasons, for monitoring and evaluation and also just for stakeholder outreach. So we have teams of monitors that travel to locations and um, meet with resettlement agencies, meet with the refugees, go through files to make sure that all the required services were provided, meet with other stakeholders in the community, but primarily it's to make sure that the resettlement agency is doing their job in terms of what they're required to do under our cooperative agreement for the refugee reception placement program. Those are those are kind of at the working level, and then at the more senior level. So our front office, our assistant secretary of state, our principal deputy, our office director, myself, uh, the director of our uh, domestic program. We each try to go out several times a year to communities, not to monitor. So these aren't aren't visits to, to check in on compliance, but to meet with mayors and governors and uh, local communities and other stakeholders. Sometimes we're invited to give speeches and we, we frame a visit around that. Uh, but I'd say uh, each of us at kind of the more senior management level try to go out a couple times a year. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, um, services to refugees are funded with federal funds. Um, but some state funds are being utilized to serve refugees as well. Is there a report that outlines all the funds and grants allocated to each state to serve refugees? Um, which I can answer with regard to the ORR funds. We have an annual report to Congress, which is published on our website, which details um, the funding that has gone to each state and for uh, what purpose that is being uh, directed. So um, it takes about a year for that report to go up after the completion of the year while the inf data is being compiled, but um, it is on our website for both uh, for past years. So you can look at what happened in the most recent year in the report, but as well what's happened in past years prior to that and any changes that have taken place over the course of time. From the State Department side, our annual report to 
Congress is actually different. Our, our report is proactive looking, and so it's a proposal. Uh, it, it's laying out the President's proposal in terms of what we want the refugee program to look like in the coming year in terms of nationalities and, and regions of the world and numbers. Um, but on the question of uh, funding going to the states, the Department of State doesn't provide any funding to states. We fund only the resettlement agencies, and so uh, when a refugee is resettled, I believe this year the per capita payment, sorry, it's either $2,025 or 2075 and that funds, uh, those funds go, that's a per capita funding amount that goes to the resettlement agency. Some of that can be used for the resettlement agency's overhead, like paying for staff and rent and vehicles, and then a certain portion of that has to be spent on the refugee camera. Great. So our last question is, are there any considerations to add new benefits or services for resettled refugees besides um, beyond the existing um, benefits that they um, that they receive when they get here, in light of escalating numbers of refugees and special circumstances this year. Well, I think the president's budget request for this year contains a number of additional items for the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, we have, for instance, enhanced our um, proposed services in the areas of um, psychological support, recognizing that many refugees are coming from um, circumstances where they've been uh, through considerable trauma, as well as our um, services to uh, victims of torture, uh, recognizing that many of the individuals who come through the refugee program have experienced torture by a government. So that, that those are examples, but we're always looking at ways that we can either shift or enhance our services uh, to refugees to respond to the most urgent needs of the populations who are coming in, and that's a constant process of reevaluation. That's why, as Kelly referenced, in addition to our monitoring, as the State Department does, ORR staff, including myself and other senior staff, regularly go out and consult at the community and state level to get feedback from actors um, in the program or civil society, schools, and others about what could be done better and how we could improve it and what's working well. And we seek to um, build on what's working well and correct um, what is uh, what could be done better. So that it's a constant process of evaluation and assessment and improvement. Thank you for that. If, um, thank you, Roberto, for managing the Q&A. Suzanne Moore's closing out the session. I want to say if we didn't completely respond to your question, please, Im or you have additional questions, please email Gilberto at Gilberto, G-I-L-B-E-R-T-O dot Mendoza, M-E-N-D-O-Z-A at N-C-S-L dot O-R-G. I'd like to, on behalf of the National Conference of State Legislatures, thank the Pew Charitable Trust for their generous support in helping sponsor this event today. And thank you so much to Kelly Gogger and Bob Carey for their informative and helpful presentations. We look forward to continuing the conversation uh, that we, of the topics we raised today. And um, the last comment from I'll leave to our speaker was that we hope that, um, as I lost my screen, I'm sorry, that stakeholders should meet with you both to discuss challenges and solutions so that you know what is being faced by schools, agencies, and states. So I look forward to continuing that conversation. Um, we will be posting a recording of today's webinar at www.ncsl.org slash webinars. And all NCSL materials on immigration can be found at ncsl.org slash IMMIG. You will soon receive an email asking you to complete a short survey to help us make these webinars even better. We do value your feedback, so please respond. This concludes today's webinar, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and asking what such great questions. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.